Chapter 8 DNA Deoxyribonucleic acid is a molecule that carries all of the genetic instructions used in the growth, development, function, and reproduction of all known living organisms. DNA and RNA are nucleic acids that alongside proteins and other complex carbohydrates are one of the major types of macromolecules that are essential for all forms of life. The DNA molecule exists of two bipolymer strands coiled around one another in order to form a double helix. DNA stores biological information. The DNA backbone is resistant to cleavage and both strands of the double-stranded structure store the same biological information. Biological information is replicated if the two strands are separated. Forensic scientists can use DNA found in blood, semen, skin, saliva, or hair found at a crime scene to thus identify any matching DNA associated with either the victim or the perpetrator. This process is called DNA profiling, but also may refer to as DNA fingerprinting. In DNA profiling, the lengths of the variable sections of repetitive DNA, such as short tandems, repeats, and missatellites, are compared between people. This method is usually an extremely reliable technique for identifying a matching DNA. However, identification can be complicated if the scene is contaminated with DNA from other people. DNA profiling was developed in 1984 by British geneticist Sir Alex Jeffries and first used in forensic science to convict Colin Pitchfork in the 1988 Enderby murder case. The development of forensic scientists and the ability to now obtain genetic matching samples of blood, saliva, or hair has led to the re-examination of many cases. Evidence can now be uncovered that was not scientifically possible at the time of the original examination. DNA fingerprint is a forensic technique used to identify individuals by characteristics using their DNA. A DNA profile is created, which is a set of DNA variations that is very likely to be different in all unrelated individuals, thereby being as unique to people as their fingerprints. DNA profiling is used in percentage testing and criminal investigation to identify a person or to place a person in a crime scene. Techniques, which are now employed globally in forensic science, help to felicitate police detective work and help clarify paternity and immigration disputes. Although 99.9% .9 of human DNA sequences are the same, enough of the DNA is different that it is possible to distinguish one person from another. DNA can be used to identify criminals with incredible accuracy when biological evidence exists. By the same token, DNA can be also used to clear suspects and exonerate persons mistakenly accused or convicted of crimes. In all, DNA technology is increasingly vital to ensuring accuracy and fairness in the criminal justice system. The test that is used to compare DNA samples is known as Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism, or RFLP. RFLP is an accurate and reliable test, but it requires a large amount of DNA to work. Labs now use tests based on the polymer chains reaction method or PCR. This method allows for testing on very small amounts of DNA from biological samples. DNA can be collected from many different sources. Almost any biological evidence can contain DNA, although not every sample contains sufficient amounts of DNA to enable profiling. Forensic investigators will analyze the biological samples to obtain the DNA profile on the person that the sample came from. If investigators already have a suspect in mind, they can collect samples to compare the evidence already collected at the scene. Assuming that investigations properly collected and handled the biological evidence and that the forensic scientists employed accepted methods and thus conduct the analysis correctly, DNA evidence is extremely accurate. The chances of one individual's DNA profile matching another person's are extremely small, about one in a billion. Compared to fingerprinting or eyewitness testimony, which both have inherent flaws and inaccuracies, DNA evidence is a highly effective way to match a suspect to biological samples collected at the scene of the crime. Because of the accuracy of DNA, criminal lawyers are increasingly relying on DNA evidence to prove a defendant's guilt or innocence. DNA evidence can also exonerate people through post-conviction analysis of biological samples. Since DNA analysis didn't exist until recently, a re-examination of evidence collected during older investigations can then reveal that the DNA profile of the person convicted of the crime does not match the DNA profile from samples taken at the crime scene. I was sitting in my cell when I first read this article about DNA. 
When I read the last paragraph about going back and testing old samples and people being set free, I almost died. I had been in prison for almost 10 years by now, and during that time, I had educated myself starting with Dick and Jane and graduating with law books. I now would focus all my attention on doing whatever it took to have the evidence in my case be re-examined using DNA. I had a lot of reading left to do. It was now 1991, and I began to discover case after case going all the way back to 1987 that used DNA. I discovered the first U.S evidentiary hearing that used DNA. In 1987, Florida's assistant state attorney, Tim Barry, began collaborating with forensic director Michael Baird to determine how DNA could be used in identifications. After a serial rapist terrorized women in Orlando, Tommy Lee Andrews was caught by two fingerprints left in the victim's window. Identification by a victim in a lineup and with the same blood type left at each scene. After two retrials, during which time Baird had been both meticulously processing the DA in evidence, and Barry prepared compelling legal briefs. In the final trial, Andrew's complicity was proven by his DNA. Genetic profiling was admitted for the first time, and DNA gained legal precedent. It was then that I thought back to my own trial, and how I was convicted only by the testimony of Sam Biggs and a blood sample. It had been 10 years, but the Sheriff Department still had to have the samples they took off of Amy. They must have her clothes and her underwear. They had processed both blood samples and scrapings from underneath her nails as well as semen. I had to contact my attorney. James Atwater was no longer that snot-nosed kid that first represented me back all those years ago. He had moved to the big city and had developed a large practice. The first opportunity I got, I called him on the phone. James, this is Thomas Anderson. Tommy, how they treat you? I was already excited, but his statement made me livid. Are you still my attorney? Yes, of course, buddy. Yeah, I am. Then why haven't you got off your ass and had the evidence in my trial tested using DNA? There was a long pause, and then, uh, I really didn't see any reason. You didn't see a reason? You're my attorney, and even you think I'm guilty? I want you to pick up the phone and petition that criminal appeals judge and request that my evidence be tested for DNA. They took blood, piss, everything from me back when I was arrested. Do something. How are they treating me? They're going to kill me if they get the chance. Sure, buddy. Okay, Thomas. I'll get right on it. As soon as I hung up the phone with James, I called Rose. Hey, baby. Is everything okay, Rose asked. I was shaking as I held the phone in my hand. DNA, baby. I just got off the phone with James. I asked him to petition the judge to have the evidence used in my trial tested for DNA. Maybe there's some hope. I could hear her breathing change. Do you think there's a chance? Hell yes. I've been reading about the DNA stuff for a week, and I know that I'm innocent. They have been using this stuff since 1987. They have all the evidence down at the state crime lab locked away in some box. They have Amy's clothing and panties with semen and then the scrapings from under her nails. They have my blood and piss. It's just a matter of time. The excitement rose in her voice. After all this time, could it really be happening? It is. I prayed about this for years. Don't get excited, baby, just in case, Rose warned me. It's science. What could go wrong? When I went back to my cell, my heart was pounding within my chest. I sat down on my cot in the lotus position and closed my eyes as I slowed my heart rate. But every time I heard footsteps coming down the walkway, I felt as if they were coming for me to tell me that I was being let out. The anticipation was horrible, and as the days stretched into weeks, I did my best to stay calm and patient. I knew that it took time. Hell, it had been 10 years already. What's a few more weeks? In my mind, I began planning my new life. I could see Rose and I getting married and moving to a little farm in the country. She could teach at a local school and I could work on trucks and do construction. All these thoughts kept racing through my mind. The thought of the first kiss I would give Rose and the first night we would spend together and the darkness holding one another in each other's arms. When the storm came up, we would throw open all the windows and put on moonlight snot, and as the curtains danced in the breeze, we would dance across the floor together. I saw my first child, a daughter. I don't know why I saw a daughter, but that is what I believed my first child was going to be. I imagined holding her for the first time and whispering to her as she slumbered over and over again how special she was and how much I loved her. Old Zip was long gone, and he was a good boy. 
We could get a new zip, zip two, and my daughter and I could walk in the fields around our home and zip two would chase rabbits. Daddy, she would say as we walked hand in hand, what were you like when you were my age? I would smile as I looked down at her. I had a dog named Zip Two, and we would go up in the woods and roam all day. We would check out all the bird's nests and follow the deer paths that led to secret pools, and I would dig worms and fish in the coolness of the forest. I was free out in those woods, and I'm free again. I would take her trick-or-treating and paint her face like a jack-o'-lantern. I would watch her and wrap gifts on Christmas morning, and someday I would walk her down the aisle and give her away. And every evening, Rose and I would sit out on the front porch holding hands in the twilight of the day and would remember the good times and the bad times. I would hold her hand so tightly because I could remember the time when that was impossible. In the years to come, I would lay to rest the demons of my past. I would get over my childhood fears and I would find peace in my life again. It was then that another poem came to me and I spoke it aloud. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch the woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near between the woods and frozen lake on the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if this is some mistake. The only other sound, the sweep of easy wind and dowry flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. That was to be my mantra. I had promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep as well. They had placed me in this prison cell with the hopes that someday they would give me death. I made promises though, promises to myself, promises to my unborn child and the woman I loved. There were still miles ahead for me in days of disappointment and pain, but also happiness. It was all to come to fruition in its own time. I had to be strong. I know that I did not kill Amy Pilford. I made my mistakes in life, but still, to this day, I would not see her death in my mind. I had imagined me killing her in a way to accept the fact that I had been railroaded by the system. It had been my way of entering this hell and not going crazy. I lied to myself in order to stay the sane. This was when there was no hope, but now with DNA, I felt as if the door had been swung wide open and anything was possible. You're only given one life and only a certain amount of time to live. In the beginning, it seems like ample enough time to do a great many things, but I have learned that it can go by so fast. Ten years have passed me by, and the majority of my youth is a distant memory. I then thought of my favorite book, The Count of Monte Cristo, and myself digging out of my prison and obtaining all that was taken from me so long ago. I had paid for all my wrongs and then some. Now I would seize the day. Carpe diem. My hands were shaking as I hung up the phone with Thomas. Could all this that he said be true? I rushed to the library and began to read all I could about DNA testing. What I read sounded very good, and it sounded like the answers to all our prayers. It had been ten long years, and I was already in my early thirties. As much as I loved Thomas, I was beginning to find myself slipping away from him. I had watched all my girlfriends start families, and I was beginning to feel like an old maid. But if this DNA thing was real, then maybe there was an indeed hope. I felt a rush flow through me and a new lease on life erupt in my heart. I began to see him walking out of prison with me hand in hand. I knew I mustn't get my hope up, but it was hard not to. I did love him and down deep in my heart, I knew that he was innocent. He just had to be. This was my dream. I loved a man and he loved me and this was our miracle. This is why God had put me in this man's life because he always had known that I deserved a happy ending. I began to dream about us getting married on the beach and the day with all our friends gathered and how happy we would be. I had always believed that if you could visualize it, then it would happen. I could visualize every detail of that wonderful day. Together we would stand hand in hand, barefoot in the sand. Into one another's eyes we would stare as above the gulls called out to us. I would be wearing a long white gown with little blue flowers up in my hair to match the color of the ocean. Thomas would be wearing a white tux. The preacher would ask me to take this man and my lawfully wedded husband, and I would say yes, yes, a thousand times yes. Ask again, and I would say ask me, and by asking again would I always confess yes, yes till the end of time, and yes to the face of death looks down upon me, and yes in sickness, and yes in health, and yes in riches, and yes in poorness. Yes a million times, yes forever, and whisper yes into my lover's ear, so it shall be a secret yes just between us. I am enraptured in my love for thee, 
and in all the years to come and I have since come. I will all remember the days that were gray and all the pain and the love each day and the day that comes anew. And then the kiss, a kiss to burn and cause the sun to shudder in bitter coldness as the bright fire that burns from the kiss. I would breathe my kiss into you and your kiss would penetrate my soul and be an eternal bond that forever chains our hearts together. In the winter of our lives, we will sit hand in hand. When all the children have fled the nest and flown away, we will sit in silent contemplation of this life we have already shared together. When my hands have become too arthritic to grasp yours tightly, it will then be my eyes that ensnare your heart. I will look at you for long hours, and you will always be young and forever in my heart. And when the hour comes that we are parted, whether it be me or you that dives into the unknown abyss, first know that with my last breath or the rest to come, I will always whisper your name as husband and with love. You are my husband and I am your wife. You are a man and I am a woman. And we were created out of one to return to one another and then dust to be picked up by the wind and swirled around where we will dance for eternity. My dreams erupted in my mind like vivid colors in my eyes. It was all bits of poetry as fine as any because this was the poetry of my life. We all write out our own chapter by chapter and verse by verse. As I write my own life story, I choose to enhance each with flamboyance and finesse. You can live a normal, quiet life, but I choose to live a life of fire and majesty. I have been denied long enough, and now is my time. I had warned Thomas about getting his hopes up, but why God, why not? Am I not to have joy in my life? Am I to be alone until I am old and gray? Can I not dare to see an ending in this long tunnel of darkness? I have dreams to pass on and dreams of immortality, not for myself, but to live forever through my children, to pass along my eyes or my nose, and through those eyes might I not see youth once again? Might through that nose I not smell flowers fresh in the spring or the ocean again for the first time? This is my prayer, O Lord, to live eternally in the heart of my children and to remember fondly even after I am gone. That is the dream of all men and women. I want to be called Mommy and have a man next to me who is called Daddy, and for us three to be together in a complete family. I'm not asking for gold or silver. I'm not asking for fame. I'm asking to be a part of something that is so common and yet so uncommon. I want a family that loves one another and cherishes one another each and every day. May I no longer be the lonely one that sits alone at the cafe or dreams alone or lies alone in the great darkness. I want to awake each morning to the sound of my family. I want tears and laughter. I want joy and pain. I want it all. Let me no longer be a living ghost that walks through life unseen by the rest of the world. Let me be common. I don't ask for special favors. I only ask to be like the rest that I see each day. Let me cook dinner and build a home filled with laughter and love. Let my joy and happiness be the song that fills my house and creates a home. I pray to you, sweet Lord, give me peace and joy and fill my heart with blessings and thanksgivings. I pray for all these things in your sweet name. Amen. In many ways, this day was the beginning of a new life for us. I knew that it would take time and we had to be patient. I could not help myself to be excited and Thomas and I spoke many times over the next few months. I planned to come and see him at the end of the month. I told all my friends and my family the good news. Over the next few months as we waited, we got our first bit of good news. James Atwater contacted Thomas through a letter and said that the pills had been approved and that the state crime lab would be sending the evidence in his case to a company that specializes in DNA testing. This was the first baby step, but it was happening. That night, I dreamt that I was on a merry-go-round, riding up and down, spinning faster and faster. As the merry-go-round turned, I looked to my right, which is into the center of the ride. I saw Thomas, and in between us both, I saw a little girl smiling as she rode her racing horse. Everything was all alive in color and music, and in the air was the smell of cotton candy. I took this dream to be a good omen, but I have never studied dream interpretation, and if I had, I would have known. A dream in which you see yourself riding a huge carousel with other people portends upcoming frustration and unfulfilled desires and dreams. The business which you set hopes on will not justify itself and will not bring you anything besides losses and regrets. I was a fool.